Welcome everyone. Uh, before we start, I have a brief bit of technology etiquette for the session. Uh, we will be muting people to limit background noise and disruption, except for people speaking at the time. Uh, we will be recording the session. Um, and there's a bar along the bottom of your Zoom screen with various buttons in it. Uh, mute, video, participants, uh, and chat. Uh, if you're able, please click on the one that says chat now. And I'll do likewise. Great. So um, you'll see a place at the bottom where it says type message here. If you type a message there and hit enter, that chat will be seen by everyone. Uh, later in the event, we will use chat to gather your questions. Uh, but can you please keep it open just for a moment here? Uh, we'll start the program in a moment, another minute or two. But first, what we'd like to do is find out who's here. So could you please type your name into the chat and also tell us where you're joining us from? Can't get the volume up. So we've got Boston, Berlin, North, Northern California, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, all over the world. That's great. Alabama. Nice. So it's great. We've got people joining us from America, Europe, and, else, and maybe a few others. Um, so I'm glad to see so many people joining us from so many different parts of the country um, and the world. Uh, let's get started. I'm Joel Obermeyer. Uh, I'm executive director of Widen the Circle. You're about to hear from some amazing and inspiring panelists. Really, very, very inspiring. Uh, they're the stars here and you'll meet them in a moment. Uh, first, let me just tell you a bit about Widen the Circle and why we're here. Uh, there are people like our panelists today in many parts of the world, people who are combating racism, anti-Semitism, and a range of other prejudice at a local level by promoting a shared understanding of the past. Widen the Circle's mission is to amplify their work and broaden its impact. Uh, we started in Germany, where we're best known for the Obermeier Awards. Uh, these annual awards honor Germans who have done profound work to preserve pieces of Jewish history and culture in Germany in communities that were destroyed by the Nazis. Many of these same people do profound work using the lessons of history to fight the rise of prejud hate, prejudice, and anti-Semitism in current time. One second here. So we think of the awards as honoring people doing extraordinary work in unexpected places. And we see the need for this in the United States too. So we're also focusing on people doing extraordinary work in unexpected places here. Today, uh, we'd like to start a conversation with some of them. A conversation that focuses on the lessons that can be learned from those who confront the legacies of racism and anti-Semitism in local projects on both sides of the Atlantic. Part of our inspiration in this comes from a connection we uncovered between Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative and two projects created by Obermeyer Award winners. One is a memorial of a more, uh, excuse me. One is a memorial wall of bricks created by sixth graders in Berlin, where each brick has a name on it of someone from the neighborhood who was killed by the Nazis. The other is the Stumbling Stones project that now identifies the homes of people killed in the Holocaust all across Europe. Brian says these two projects helped him develop his thinking about the National Memorial to Victims of Lynching, now in Montgomery, Alabama. Our panelists today do their work in very different ways, but all of them are creating a shared understanding of the past, which is a crucial step in combating hate. And those panelists are uh, Sheila Washington, Executive Director and Founder of the Scottsboro Boys Museum and Cultural Center in Scottsboro, Alabama. Hey, Sheila. Hello. Good to see you. Good to see uh, you. You bet. Uh, and then Joseph McGill, 
founder of the Slave Dwelling Project and history and culture coordinator of the Magnolia Plantation in Charleston, South Carolina. Hey, Joe. Good to see you. Okay. And finally, Gabriel Hanna, storyteller, author, and winner of a 2019 Obermeyer Award from the Rhine-Hesse region of Germany. She's joining us from Germany today. Hey, Gabi. Hey. Uh, though they do this in very different ways, all three of them are making people aware of historic injustice and persecution in communities where people don't always want to talk about it. Each panel is, panelist is changing the way their local community relates to its own history. Another way to say this is that they are changing their community's own underlying narrative. And we believe that changing that narrative can lead communities and people toward healing. As you're listening today, I invite all of you uh, in this, at this event, I invite all of you to think about ways in which historical narratives have changed where you are and in communities that you know, especially where healing has started. After you hear from the panelists, uh, there will be time for you to ask them questions in the chat. Our formal program is scheduled to run about 75 minutes. Um, our panelists have agreed to stay on longer for, in, for informal questions and answers for those who are able to stay longer. Uh, so let's get started. And we're gonna start with um, Sheila, Sheila Washington, executive director and founder of the Scottsboro Boys Museum and Cultural Center in Scottsboro, Alabama. For two decades, she worked for the city of Scottsboro and in 2010, she established the museum to tell the story of nine African-American teenagers who were falsely excused, accused of rape and then convicted in a Scottsboro courthouse by an all-white jury in 1931. Eight out of nine were sentenced to death. That case drew national attention at the time. When it was appealed, it went to the Supreme Court and resulted in landmark rulings on the right, on the right to adequate counsel and a diverse jury. The final Scottsboro boy did, was not freed from prison until 19 years after the case began. As you'll hear from Sheila, as you'll hear, uh, Sheila worked against the odds to start the museum, which educates visitors from throughout the United States and the world about the Scottsboro boys. So welcome Sheila. And um, it's great to have you here. Thank you. And let me start with a very basic question. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover here. Um, first, can you maybe take me a minute, take a minute to tell me the story you told me uh, about the hidden book and what motivated you to focus on the Scottsboro Boys at all? Well, I was 17 uh, years old when I found a book hidden under my parents' bed. Uh, every Saturday we had to run the vacuum and all I saw under their bed was a pillowcase. And I wonder what was in the pillowcase. So one day curiosity got the best of me. And uh, I opened the pillowcase up and inside the pillowcase wrapped in plastic was just a simple little paperback book, Scott's Girl, Haywood Patterson's story. So I said, oh, it's just a book. So I just started reading the book and my uh, father saw me reading the book. And he took the book away from me. He said, I don't want you to read this book. It's too much hurtful, harmful things that you don't need to know about in the book. And he took the book and put it away. And in 1978, my brother was in Kilby Prison, the same prison the Scotchman Boys was housed in. And um, him and another young black boy had killed an elderly white man in Scottsboro, and they were sentenced to life in prison in Kilby. And uh, he was only there uh, maybe two years before he was stabbed to death so many times that his body wouldn't hold in bombing fluid. And I found my book again and I read it. And I said, one day when I get older, I'm gonna find a place and honor the Scottsboro boys with my brother and put this book on a table and burn a candle in their memory. Wow. Uh, when we talked, 
One of the things you said was you were trying to change what people thought about the Scottsboro Boys case right in the place where it happened. Um, you also said some local people didn't want, it, want the history to be told. Uh, can you give an example, uh, maybe like the great grandson of the founder of the town, that story you told me earlier? The grandson of uh, the founder of Scottsboro came uh, to the museum. They, they kept saying he wanted to meet with me. So I said he could meet with me at the museum. And it was wintertime on a Saturday afternoon, about four o'clock. And he had parked his car across the street. He didn't want anybody to see him coming into the museum. And as soon as he walked into that museum, he said, I want this museum closed and I want it closed now. And I looked at him and I said, no, sir. I said, this museum is paid for and it's not gonna be closed. And he like sort of jerked back and looked at me and he said, we don't want it here. And I said, well, it's too late. I said, the story is out there and it's gonna be told. And he said, well, it didn't happen here. I said, well, what happened here was that they was convicted and tried and sentenced to death for false accusations that they didn't do. I said, hey, it was no rape that took place. And he ordered me down, yes, it was. And I said, well, Mr. Scott, I said, do you know the story of the Scottsville boys? He said, I know what my grandparents have told me. And we began to sit down and talk and he did not know that much history of this case was known around the world. It was just like the 1930s in his mind. And this place was like um, no communication outside of uh, the valley to know how important this case was in history. And they didn't want to learn about how important it was. They wanted to just to go away. And after I finished talking to him for about an hour and a half, uh, he got ready to leave. I told him the museum wasn't going to close. And uh, he shook my hand real firm. And he said, you tell a good story. And I knew his foundation give the white grants. And I said, well, is it OK for me to apply for one of your grants? He said, yeah, go ahead and apply. So I applied for our first grant from the Bonham Foundation. And they awarded us $5,000 to put all our electronics and buy a computer. Wow, that's a great story. Uh, so I, I think um, we should probably talk a little bit about the Scottsboro Boys case at the, itself. Um, you know, it's a, it's a long story and we don't have enough time to do it justice here. So maybe I'm wondering when you're trying to sum up the story for young people, uh, what do you say to help them connect and I'm particularly hoping you'll include the story about the youngest Scottsboro boy. It was nine black young teenagers that was accused of rape that day in March of 1931. And the youngest being 12. And he did not know what rape was. And um, he was standing there with his brother, Andy. First time ever leaving home on his way to Memphis with his 15 year old brother to find work, that's how desperate they were. And so when I have a group of students to come, I asked who's 12, who's 15, who's, who's the ages of the Scotsboro boys? And they raised their hands. And I said, can you imagine leaving home and um, your first time away from home and you get off a train and paint wrong and not knowing why you're getting off the train. And all of a sudden, two white women accuse you of rape and you don't know what rape is. And some of the 12, 11 and 12 year old raised their hands, they didn't exactly know what rape was. So I told them they would have to go home and talk to their parents. But to reach the teenagers, you have to put them there with the age to see how young and desperate they were to get out, to go find work, to help their parents at home sense. Uh, you know, you spent many years and had a lot of difficulty opening the museum, as, as you mentioned. Uh, then you had this major victory when the governor came to the museum in 2016 to acknowledge the wrongs that were done. Uh, can you maybe uh, explain what happened then and what it meant? Well, the governor had told me beforehand that he could not exonerate 
the Scottsboro boys, he didn't have the power. So I got with some lawyers, Republican and Democrat lawyers, and we came together. Don't tell me that you can't come together for a good cause. Uh, the Republican lawyers and the Democrats and the Black Caucus work behind the scene to push a legislation into the uh, governor's office for him to his own rate and posthumous pardon three of the Scottsboro boys and, and uh, exonerate all nine of them. So when he walked in the door of the museum, he said, Sheila, he said, I got a surprise for you today. And I said, what governor? He said, I'm going to exonerate all nine of the Scottsboro boys today. And tears of joy just overflowed to know that the prayers of those nine boys' mother had been answered because they had prayed for their sons to be free. Although they didn't live to see their names cleared in history, but they cleared today in books of history, telling them that the governor exonerated them in 2013. I imagine that was very important for their descendants though, yes? Very important. The only descendant that we found was uh, the son of Clarence Norris Jr. Uh, he lives in Macon, Georgia, and Clarence Norris has two daughters in New York City. Nice. Um, can you tell me a story about someone who was, ha, has experienced the work you've done uh, in a way that was transformational for them? Uh, I'm thinking about this man from Paint Rock you told me about, and I know you have a couple of other examples as well. It was a 87 year old man that came to the museum from uh, North Carolina. He, he, he grew up in Paint Rock. He's 11 years old, I think he said, when this happened. And he said that he saw them when they was taken off the train and his father was part of the posse they had formed to hang those boys that day. And um, he said, although those boys didn't get killed, it was a killing that day. He said, several, we really don't know how many people were on the train. Some of them tried to run to the river, he said, and was shot down. And he began to cry and said, forgive my father and the sins of my father for what happened that day. And his daughter said he had to make this journey to see this museum to ask for forgiveness. And the museum has a place that we call healing and restoration for people to come in and tell their stories of how this has affected their lives. Wow, great. Uh, Sheila, uh, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, do you have any specific projects you want uh, to talk about and let people know about? We, <laughs> we are uh, 10 years old this year. We made it a decade in this city without any help from the city of Scottsboro or any money coming in from any of uh, the businesses or uh, the governments here. But finally, the city has recognized us as a beacon of light in a dark situation that they didn't want to be a part of. Now, they uh, first time, they granted us $20,000 towards a renovation project that we are undertaking to uh, bring our museum up to the 21st century. And it will talk to you when you come into the museum. So we're doing a fundraiser for $100,000. On our website, you can go to our GoFundMe account and make a donation there to help with the renovation. And your name will go on the contributors uh, plaque as you walk into the foyer of the museum. Wonderful. So we're um, putting out a link to that GoFundMe page in the chat. And uh, for others who are participating, we also will include that link in one of the follow-up emails we send you after the event. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much, Sheila. Uh, we'll get back to you in the Q&A portion. If you have questions for Sheila, you can hold on to them or you can send them to Dan, Dan Fleschler via the chat, um, but we'll also be putting questions in the chat later on the event. 
And um, now let's turn to Joe McGill. There we go. Uh, Joseph McGill is founder of the Slave Dwelling Project. He is also the history and culture coordinator of the Magnolia Plantation in Charleston, South Carolina. He, um, since 2010, he has slept in and led tours of 150 slave dwellings throughout the United States. And by throughout, I really mean throughout. Uh, he frequently does presentations about the realities of slavery and the contributions of enslaved people. Joe was previously a field officer for the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Uh, welcome, Joe, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. You bet. Uh, could you please tell us briefly about the Slave Dwelling Project, both what you do and, and, and how you got started? And I was particularly struck by the story you told me about the first time you slept in a slave dwelling. Um, so I'm really hoping you could tell, that, tell me that one uh, and the story related to dogs. Yeah, um, so sleeping in slave dwellings, uh, an idea that I came up with about 10 years ago um, with an effort to bring attention to these places um, associated with these nice, beautiful homes that we are accustomed to, to seeing and, and take joy in seeing, but usually attached to these places are these slave dwellings, which got less attention. Uh, my attention, uh, my attempt to bring attention to them is it was to sleep in them. So my very first uh, night in a slave dwelling was at Boone Hall Plantation in, in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, uh, and waking up to dogs barking in the background and thinking about enslaved people running uh, for freedom and being uh, chased by dogs. So this idea that I had that had now come to fruition was now really coming to life in my mind when I when I experienced that time waking up at three o'clock at the in the slave cabin at, uh, at Boone Hall Plantation in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. And, and you're sleeping on the floor. You're not there's, there's, it's uh, like just in the dwelling. There's no there's no extra stuff in there with you. Right. It, it, it was like the floor because that's when I discovered I uh, know not only did I need a, a sleeping bag, I needed a padding also. Fair enough. Um, so yes. For sure. Um, in a few sentences, can you summarize what you're trying to show people who encounter your work? Uh, what is the main thing you want them to learn? Well, I want them to learn that uh, the things that they visit these sites for, the nice, beautiful homes, that's important. We need to know that story, uh, but we also need to know the stories of the people who were enslaved because it was their enslavement that uh, allowed that nice, beautiful home to exist because it was their labor that was stolen for it to exist or their physical building of that place, the, uh, the cutting down of the trees to uh, frame the house, uh, the making of the bricks that's now that house, the labor that was stolen for that house to exist. So that uh, that needs to be a part of the narrative also. Uh, since you already stopped, ta started talking about how these homes were built, I'm gonna switch just, just a second. Um, you know, you talked a lot about how to help people connect with the lives of enslaved Americans through the spaces that they were, that they lived in and where they were forced to work. Um, I was hoping if you would just talk about uh, the bricks and the fingerprints for a second. Oh yeah. Um, so, you know, sleeping, story. yeah, yes. Yeah, you know, sleeping in, in places, oh, that's easy. Um, but you, you gotta try to uh, get people to relate to physical spaces. Well, and, and connect dots to history. Well, um, bricks was uh, it was made by enslaved people. You know, you got to process the clay and put it in the molds and let the let it dry. Well, in in taking these bricks uh, out of the molds, sometimes they got a little um, they got a little stubborn, but they had they had to come out out of the mold anyway. And then sometimes in forcing these bricks out of the mold, sometimes you left fingerprints there. So what I do is. I go around the city uh, looking for fingerprints or any, any place that I, I go to. It's, it could be in the city of Charleston or, or any, any slave dwelling that I might go to. And I look for fingerprints in these bricks. And a lot of times I find these fingerprints and I put my fingers there for comparison to who may have been making these bricks. And almost always my fingers are way too big 
So that's an indication that there were children uh, making these bricks. And it, it, it just so happened that I got, um, in addition to what you see on the screen, I've got one holding in my hand here. I don't know how that shows up there. Um, but um, yeah, this brick here, you may see got, Oh yeah, yeah, I can see it really well. So, so there they are. Um, so you can find bricks uh, like this. And that's that evidence. To me, it's the ancestors reaching um, out and we're reaching back, said so the ancestors are saying, we were here tell our story. Yeah, that this makes is sense. evidence. And, and it feels to me like having hands for some reason, and I mean, the actual hands, holding something in your hand is a very powerful way to connect to that physically. Um, let me, I'm going to switch gears just for a second, because there's one story I was really hoping you'd tell. Um, you told me about your visit to the Anne Frank House in Amsterdam. And could you ex briefly explain uh, what that was and the impact it had on you? Yeah, I was in the military at the time, very young, uh, part of a group with, with, with no intent to, to, to do anything of substance, but, you know, but have fun. Um, but a part, of the, a part of the trip was a, um, a trip into that space where Anne Frank hid from the, hid from the Germans. Um, and, and, and going into that space, it, it did something to me. Although it was not my intent when I got there, I, I felt it. I, I finally remembered what was trying to, uh, my teacher was trying to teach me when I was in that class, um, maybe not listening fully, but being in that space, it, it, it brought that knowledge back to me of why. And because I was there, um, I understood it more. And, and what that taught me was spaces are important, so it, you know, uh, because we need to be able to experience these places, although the, all the history attached to that place is, is not always positive, um, but it's not always negative either, because that was a place of, of solitude for them. As long as they were in that space, they were protected. So that's important. We need, we need to know this thing. And I apply that same concept to slave dwellings because Although all the history associated with slave dwellings is not positive, that was a place of, of solitude for the enslaved, some solitude that could be interrupted at the expense of the enslaver. But same applies. The places should exist. So these feelings of um, those who want to experience these places, they'll have that opportunity when the spaces are there. So Joe, you feel that there's kind of a very strong powerful feeling just by being in a space and being kind of immersed in the space. Y yes, and, and I'm, I'm uh, working at Magnolia Plantation and Gardens and being having the opportunity to uh, introduce slave dwellings to the, to the folks who choose to come on that tour and, and see their interaction with the space. Um, it, it's, it's, it's exhilarating to me because if those spaces were gone, you know, the, the, not, the denial of the existence of the people who lived in those spaces can, can you know, proceed, can happen. Gotcha. Um, could you briefly tell us about the positive impact your work has had on people and how it's changed their perspectives? And, and what I'm thinking about is a story you told about a group you talked to at the Point of Honor Museum in, in Virginia. Yeah, Lynchburg, Virginia, Point of Honor Museum. Um, I, three months ago, three months ago, I visited there. Um, and uh, there, there was a, a group, it was a public event, we were social distancing. And um, the, it was a, the, the demographics, quite diverse, you know, uh, white folks, black folks. And the white folks in the audience uh, were relating to their time at this place in the 60s, they had access. They were talking about all the recreation, all the things that they were uh, allowed to do at this gathering place. Well, the African-American um, uh, component of the group, well, it was different for them. They, did, they were denied access. Um, a time in, in our history when there was, um, when there was segregation. Um, and in those things, there were laws on the books that said, you know, the, in this public place, you're not welcome. Um, um, and so they were looking at this site from that angle. 
and, and now because of this program going on and, and the Slave Dwelling Project being there and being the centerpiece of the program that's happening, you know, we bring these different audiences together to have these kinds of experiences, to have these kinds of conversations. And, and this was one of those times where, you know, these two worlds came together to realize that they were living, living at the same time, but in different worlds. So they, these sites have the power to do that. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you for telling me, telling us that. Um, uh, let me just ask uh, one more uh, question. Do you have any upcoming projects you'd like to tell us about? Yeah, um, this year, um, we're, we were supposed to be having our conference, our sixth conference at uh, yep. uh, Clemson University. Uh, but of course, science dictates that we do otherwise. Well, we're going to um, keep that uh, partnership, that collaboration. And I, I'm, uh, we're going to have a a conference in at Clemson with the collaboration of Clemson University, but we're going to do it digitally, similar to the way you guys are re, uh, right. are interacting with us now. You will have that the opportunity. Uh, we'll get that word out once we put the meat on the bones and 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 figure out the details and and call for proposals. We'll put all that out there at the appropriate time. But people who are interested should just come to your website. Is that right? Uh, Correct. Sign up. Yes. Great. Great. We'll we'll put that in chat. That'll also be uh, in a link in the follow-up in your email we send it out after the event. So great. Uh, thank you so much, Joe. Uh, we'll get back to you in the Q&A portion. Uh, if you have questions for Joe, you can hold on to them. You can send them to Dan in the chat if you want. Uh, we'll be putting questions in chat later on in the event. Um, and now we're going to switch gears to Germany. There we go. Uh, so Gabriel Hanna. Gabriel Hanna is a storyteller and an author, uh, working closely with her brother and his wife, Hans Dieter and Martina Graf. Uh, she keeps alive the memory of German Jews in the Rhine-Hesse region, whose communities were destroyed by the Nazis. Her specialty is powerful personal stories that make the lives of individual Jews spring to life. Along with the Grafs, she has written several books and many articles about Jews in the region, including a well-documented 556 page long page turner, The Jews of Old Rhine, which reads like a novel. Uh, in 2019, Gabrielle, her brother and sister-in-law received an Obermeyer Award at the Berlin Parliament. Uh, thank you for joining us, Gabi. Thanks for having me. You bet. Uh, you've heard from two people who focus on the racist past in America. And before we get into the specific of the work you do, uh, I hope you'll set a little context for us. Can you give us a few of the key challenges facing people who do what we call remembrance work in Germany? Um, there are several challenges, but I can think of, of um, a few right now. Germany has spent decades of coming to terms with its criminal past. And there are just people here who don't want to hear anything about it anymore. And then uh, the other challenge we face um, is that Jews are viewed as um, victims and not as uh, subjects of history. Is that because people just know them for the Holocaust and not for other things? That's right, because the focus is on the Holocaust. When we think about uh, uh, Jewish German history, what comes to mind right away are those 12 years of the Nazi era. What we forget is that um, Jews were simply German citizens who, uh, who um, contributed so much to the communities that they lived in. Okay. And then, and of course, like in the United States, but here too, we have to face anti-Semitism, which has not gone away. You have people in the United States marching like in Charlottesville, holding up Nazi sim uh, symbols and chanting, what, what, what did they chant? Like, uh, it, it's a, a, we don't know, have to Jews do that. will never replace us. Yeah, and sure. We have, we have our uh, Nazis marching again too. So I, we, I hear face, you. we face I, similar problems. Yeah, I mean, it's just, um, it's amazing that we have to still talk about this in this way, but it, it's true. Yeah. Um, so let me, let me move along a little bit more toward your work. Uh, can you talk about the resistance you've run into and the objections to your work? I, I know you have many supporters, 
but at the same time, I'm hoping you can talk about the various articles you wrote for the newspaper uh, about local Jewish history. Yeah, we, um, as long as we stayed in the time before the Nazi era, everything was fine and everyone liked our stories. And these are stories about local history in the local, um, local Jewish history about people that we found uh, extremely interesting or we found that people should know about them. So we wrote all these stories and, and put them out there for people to read and, and they liked those. But once we got to the crucial years after Hitler took power, that all changed. And we had started a newspaper, a series about that time. And um, it prompted a lot of negative comments. And they range from when will they let us forget it to, well, they and they meant the Jews, they could have come back if they had only wanted to. And never mind that they were expelled from the villages or killed in the Holocaust. So, and the resistance grew to a point where uh, local officials called us and threatened to have the newspaper article stopped. And it's very sad to say that they succeeded with us. I hear you. Um, you know, uh, let's let's turn toward um, you know work where where we really uh, made a difference. Uh, we have so much ground to cover and we can't do justice to it all. So in just a couple of minutes, can you talk about the importance of a well-told personal story or well-told personal stories in your work? Uh, maybe you can tell us briefly about your approach um, that started with the book about Abraham David. Right. Um, well, like you said before, I, I've been working uh, with my brother and sister-in-law for many years now to help restore the memory of the Jewish communities uh, in our area where we grew up. And our approach is to tell individual personal stories of the people who lived there. So the first story that we came, um, that we told was that of 17 year old Abraham David from our own home village, who set out to America uh, in the middle of the civil war, where he ended up to become one of the most successful merchant tailors in North Carolina, uh, in Wilmington, North Carolina. And our first book was about him. And the research we did uh, into his life opened up a whole new world for us. Uh, the world of the Jewish past of our villages. And 17-year-old uh, Abraham David, uh, if you will, was, was the founding father of our book, The Jews from the Old Rhine River. And, and but again, you've carried on with this idea that the personal stories are how you connect with people. Well, stories are about people, right? And places, and they're not about concepts and ideas. And it's hard to grasp the murder of six million Jews unless you know one of them. And stories uh, have the power to connect us to the past and to connect us to each other. A story runs on emotions, not, of course, you have to have your fact, uh, facts, but it runs on emotions. And I can, even if it's just for a brief moment in time, I can live somebody else's life and learn from his or her experiences. So this was our approach and we, um, we vowed to find them all and to tell their stories, and we did. I think it was about 1,700 people. So. Wow, nice. Um, so I'm going to switch a little bit here. Um, aside from your regular work with your brother and sister-in-law, you've been active in the network Widen the Circle has been building, which tries to connect people doing similar local history work all over Germany. Uh, could you give me an example of other work that fights bigotry by teaching the lessons of history. Uh, for example, can you talk briefly about the anti-Semitism project in Halle? Oh, oh yeah, um, <clears throat> the project in Halle. Uh, well, you have to know that last year there was a terrorist attack um, of a right-wing crazy person. Right, This, this, and this was on Yom Kippur? 
exactly. somebody tried to break into the synagogue and ended up killing a few people. Yeah. And um, a historian in Halle, um, he's a friend of ours, Dr. Anton Hieke. He works together with a synagogue there and with other partners and together they go into schools and teach uh, students there about the history that's all around, about the Jewish history that's all around, around them. And at the same time, um, I think the program trains um, <clears throat> members of the Jewish community and they go into schools and meet with students and talk to them so they can really get a feel of what it is like for Jews to live in Germany today and to meet them and talk to them. Great, great. I think and, that's and, a wonderful there, program. No, it, it's great. And there are many other examples I know. Uh, we just don't have time to talk about all of them. Uh, one last question before we, we wrap up. Um, you also wrote a children's book which tells the true story of two dogs and their Jewish owners during the Nazi era. Can you talk about why you went in that direction? Why, why a children's book? And how does, that, how, how, does, how does that fit in? You're talking about our heroes, Moppy and Peter. Yep, that's right. Two dogs. Um, <clears throat> well, I think we have to help, we have to help our children to realize um, to what prejudice and hate can lead to. Now, the Nazi era is a very difficult topic to teach to children. So you have to keep the story simple. You need a lot of illustrations and pictures that support the narrative. You, and you need to provide the, uh, with that, and that's very important, with characters that they can identify with and that they can feel with. And the character story needs to be very simple. Well, Moppy and Peter's message is simple and true. <clears throat> there is no such thing as a Jewish dog or a German dog. A dog is simply a dog. And this was our approach with Moppy and Peter. And I hope they're still out there barking somewhere. That's great. I do too. I do too. Um, if people want to know more about your work, where can they go? Um, they can go on um, Widen the Circle. There's our profile. And they can go to our uh, web page. I see it in the, in the chat room. We'll share it, I promise. We'll share it in the chat, yeah, right. And, um, and then you will find out what we did, what we are up to, and what we are planning. And one thing I can already tell is that my brother and sister-in-law will publish a book next next year. It will be published next spring. And they've been working on it for a long time together with our friend from Berlin, who is one of the fathers of Mopi and Peter. Great, great. So we'll hear more about that story. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Gabi. Uh, we'll get back to you shortly in the Q&A portion of the event. Um, and now I'm just gonna pause for a second and uh, talk to all three of our guests. So thank you, Sheila, Joe, and Gabi. Those are great stories, great insights. Now I'd like to do something a little different. I'd like to ask for some insights from our audience. Um, so as you've listened to our speaker's stories, perhaps you have also been reflecting on your own experiences. I invite you to think about communities that you know where the view of history has changed, where people are actually doing an impressive job of educating others about the history of local racism, prejudice, or anti-Semitism, and where healing has started. Uh, if you have such a community in mind, please share just a few words about it in the chat box, and we'll check in on your answers in just a few minutes. So, so please, please, if you have something, please share it, because uh, we'd really like to see them. Great, so we'll come back to that. But now I'm going to start with just a few questions and answers, uh, really just one, I think. And then we'll open it up to everyone in the audience. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box and send them to my teammate, Dan. Uh, and let me just check. Rebecca, how are we doing on time? Uh, we're great, actually, so. Wonderful, okay, great. So um, I'm now gonna ask a question of all of our panelists. 
Uh, what advice do you have for someone who is starting to create or develop a local remembrance project? I know from each of you how hard it is, but I also get the feeling that it's been very rewarding. Uh, can you give a, a couple of sentences of advice? And maybe, I mean, this time I think I'm going to start with Gabby. Okay. Um, it's always hard to give, give advice because, you know, even we don't, know anymore how we got into all of this but um don't ever think that you're alone or that you cannot make a difference because that will lead to the point where you don't do anything you need to know that you have all of us that widen the circle that you can turn to and we will will be there to help so that's the first thing Sure. The second thing is to have courage, come up with new ways to remember. We need new, way, uh, new uh, ways to remember. You know, what's the point to breathe life into a vanished Jew Jewish community when Jews in Germany today are sitting on packed suitcases again? And my best advice is go to the gym. You will need the strength to keep going. Hmm. And be prepared for closed doors and for people who will oppose you. So do that. Maybe you do that first. And I assume there's also a rewarding part. Yeah, because um, because you will you will if you if you get into this, you will not stop. You will get so fascinated with it. And it's so rewarding that um, I'm very confident that once you start, you will not stop. Great, great. Um, let's go to uh, let, let's go to Sheila. Sheila, how about you? What advice do you have? And I'm particularly thinking about. I know how hard it is, and I know how hard your story's been, but I get the feeling also that it's been very rewarding. Uh. If you, uh, my thing is, if you have a dream, don't give up on it. Uh, it will, as the scripture says in the Old Testament, that it will surely come to pass. And at 17, I had a dream <coughs> that one day that I was going to honor those nine Scottsville boys. And the attack came when. I started talking about it. I even lost my job because of the Scottsdale Boys. I was working at City Hall for 22 years and uh, the mayor was very prejudiced. They were gonna do a walking trail and I mentioned to him, oh, wouldn't it be good to do something for the Scottsdale Boys? And he pointed his finger to the tip of my nose and said, you leave that dead dog sleeping and don't you do anything to resurrect it. And I said, if only he could see me now, that I didn't lose anything, that I found my purpose in life, that you have to stay away from negativity, be strong, be courageous, and always have faith that one day that this too shall come to pass. Oh, that's a great message. Um, Joe, I don't know how you follow up that. <laughs> <laughs> but what advice do you have? And, you know, as I said, I got the feeling that it's very rewarding. Uh, Go for yeah, it. Per persistence, persistence. Uh, you know, I didn't think that uh, right. 10 years ago, I'd be, I'd be sitting here giving uh, folks advice on, on how they could, uh, you know, do something for 10 years and, and love it. Um, <laughs> you know, you know, what I, you know, what, what I do is simple. I, I, I sleep. Sleeping is easy. Um, but you know, you, you got to see how these ideas, you got to allow these ideas to grow. Uh, don't hold on to it so tightly that you don't want to give up portions of it, uh, to right. others that you trust that, you know, can help move it along. Um, so it's, it's, it's going, it's going to take that and be tough, uh, coming right out of the blocks because, um, uh, as, as Sheila stated, you, you're going to get that pushback. And a lot of times it's, it's pushback from folks who look like you. So, you know, be prepared for that and, 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 and persist. And also um, feeding off of Sheila, have that faith. 
And and I assume it's also for you. It must be very rewarding as well, though. Yeah, ten years later, I'm 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 still at it. And see, now the uh, is reverse. You know, ten years ago, I I was reaching out to folks trying to sell this crazy idea to them. You know, now it's reversed. They call me trying to get in on it. So so yes, yeah, rewarding. That's great. That's great. Um, I'm just going to pause for a second. Rebecca, do we have some answers coming in to the question I posed? And uh, could we hear a little bit about what people have to say? Absolutely. We have some really great responses here in the chat. Um, I'm just going to read a few select ones. So from uh, Rabbi Joel N. He said, here in Scott's, uh, Scotch Plains and Fanwood, New Jersey, we have a created a truth, racial healing, and transformation committee um, to work in our community. Uh, I see a note from Ben who says, uh, he's based in Plymouth, Massachusetts, and um, he actually notes that there needs to be more uh, information shared about the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe um, that's existed there for thousands of years um, and has had to fight to maintain their federal, federally recognized tribal status, um, which is constantly threatened. Um, so more needs to be done there. Um, Rachel Kay says, um, I cannot say healing has begun, but the story of um, Clotilda and the founding of Africa Town in Mobile, Alabama is fascinating. Many of us wish the white community would step up and join the conversation. So thank you for that, Rachel. Um, and uh, Corey Munson said, I grew up in Gainesville, Florida. This weekend, the Aluccia County Remembrance Project had a storytelling live stream in which three people spoke about the legacy of racism in their own lives in terms of lynching and th of their ancestors and responding to police brutality and hate speech. So um, some really uh, interesting comments. One, one last one, maybe uh, Sandy C. Okay, go ahead. In Concord uh, in, in Medford, Massachusetts. Um, there are some groups informing visitors about slavery in those towns, um, including where slaves lived. And I know Joe has been to Medford specifically uh, and, and slept there, so. Great, great. Those are all great. Uh, really, thank you so much for that. Um, next, let's turn to your questions as everybody who's joining us. Please, if you have a question, enter it into chat and send it to Dan. Um, in order to cover as many questions as possible, Dan will be moderating and reading the questions. I'll be sort of like a traffic cop, making sure we, uh, who, we know who's going to answer. Um, and again, before we just start, Rebecca, how are we doing on time? Still okay? Yeah, if you want to do maybe one more question yourself, and then we can turn it over to Dan. Yeah, you know what, I think we'll, let's just go to Dan. I feel like we have such a big crowd, so many from people from varied backgrounds. Uh, you know, I can ask questions all day long, but I'd really love to hear some from, from the people who are joining us. Great. So, uh, Dan. Oh, Dan, you're muted. There you go. There you um, go. From Nancy Easterly, Joe slept in historic Sutterly's slave cabin, and then seven years later came back and slept in the manor house, while others slept in the slave cabin. I would love for him to share the importance of highlighting that space as well, how the lives of the enslaved must be remembered in all spaces. Yeah. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so when I when I slept at Soler, Soderly, uh, it may have been my first Maryland, uh, my, my first venture in, into the state of Maryland because 70 years ago, that's early on for this project. Um, and and Soderly was one of those places that got it and got it early. There was a tobacco growing plantation, which was very special to me because when I was younger, I worked in tobacco fields. So um, there uh, relating to the, um, the, the way enslaved people worked in tobacco versus the way I did when I was a, a, a young man was an opportunity. And the second time I stayed there um, was, was great also. They had uh, made lots of improvement on their uh, interpretation of those who were enslaved there. And the conversations both times that we had around the campfire uh, was, was quite engaging. So uh, experience. So Joe, let me just clarify something though. Um, what about the idea of not just looking at slave dwellings, but also kind of the house where the um, sort of the, the uh, enslaver lived, um, and sort of seeing both of those spaces? Because uh, I think that's what that question was about. 
Yeah. Yeah. Once, you know, once upon a time, <clears throat> you know, once upon a time, uh, very long ago, 10 years ago, uh, the, the main house was not of interest to me. Um, and, and I would go there and they would, um, uh, that's the first thing they wanted to show me. Well, what I've learned is I, I have to take interest in the in the in the big house because of the house itself, the stolen labor to um, to ensure that house exists. But when you go physically in that house, you can see those things um, that separated the races, the spatial segregation within. Um, how the enslaved people interacted within that space and sometimes how architecturally that segregation was <clears throat> designed into that building itself. So yeah, I, 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 I always uh, go and, and, and see the differences, you know, the nice beautiful um, grand staircase uh, as you went in through that front door versus right. the more compact stairs when you open the back door and the access for the enslaved people, you can see the differences. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Dan, another question? Uh, this is from Corey for Sheila. Um, could you please share more about the healing and restoration space? What it looks like and how people are invited and supported to share their stories? And I just want to add, Sheila, if you could tell us what you told us about uh, the three uh, the Holocaust survivors that you, uh, that you presented to. Uh, yes, when I'm here, uh the presentation at the museum. I never know who's sitting in the audience or how, uh, where people are from or their background. And so I was telling the story of how uh, slavery and how the Jim Crow era, era uh, the lynching of black people and how many souls have been lost. And I was talking about the day in Paint Rock when the older man came back and said, although these nine guys didn't get killed, but it was a killing that day. See, that's not written down anywhere at all. So when I got through telling the story, it was three sisters sitting on the front row and they were crying. And um, they said, you know, we was treated just as bad as the blacks. And I said, yeah, and I didn't know what they're talking about. And they pulled up there shirt and show me the numbers that was inside of their, under their wrist and, and they were survivors of the Holocaust and their father had slipped them out and brought them up to Skyline Mountain to a potato farm and they had hid out for all of these years and they would never wear short sleeves they told me because they never wanted people to ask them about the numbers that was on their wrist. And the healing part of the museum is when you walk into the foyer and we have a pew dedicated to that section where people can sit and cry. Or they can cry anywhere in the museum they want to. But before they make it to the front, some of them stop right there and begin to cry and ask just for forgiveness and healing uh, from all of this hatred that came about during the Scottsboro Boys case. And uh, Gabriel, I, I just want you to know that uh, I am a Hadassah member. I joined that a couple of years ago at the 100 year anniversary. So uh, the Jewish people that uh, recognized Samuel Leibowitz, who was a Jewish lawyer that recognized that represented these boys for uh, all the time they were in prison because of him. And, and, she, 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 and Sheila. Museum. And Sheila, right. He represented them for 20 years, right? It was not. Right. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Keep going. Uh, but um, I was going to say it's just because of him that a Jewish family gave half the money when I was trying to raise it. And when they told me I couldn't raise it, that it would never happen. Within five days, I had a check from this Jewish family. And when I carried over to the legislative office, I never will forget how they put it up to the light, turned it over to see if it was a real check. And to this day, the Jewish community supports the Scotch for Boys Museum. Wow. Very good. 
Nice. And I just wanted to let you all know I'm sitting in a plantation house uh -huh. on a Zoom video. The big house. Got it. Oh, okay. <laughs> got it. Wait, wait. Yep, I got it. We, we had to move you, uh, have you go someplace else just to make sure we had the right connection. Um, Dan, another question? Oh, Dan, you're muted again. This is for Gabby from Bryan in, in Maryland. Um, Sheila and Joe talked about communicating to descendants whose ancestors were connected to slavery or Jim Crow. Um, Ms. Hannah, what connections have you made with the descendants of German Jews? That's like a softball question. That's a softball <laughs> for me. This is true. Well, this was what our project was all about from the very start. When we started out, we pledged that uh, we wouldn't stop. Well, I, I think I have to backtrack. Just one sentence, so it's not too long. Um, we did not want the Jewish history of the uh, the, the Jewish uh, the, the history of the Jewish communities <clears throat> to end in the Holocaust, uh, because Jewish life went on, if not in our villages, then somewhere else, and so from the very start we tried to locate and communicate with and ask uh, the Jewish descendants to, um, if they wanted to, to be involved in our work. And we set out and we pledged, we did not want uh, to stop until the pictures in their family albums turned into color, just as ours did. And um, so that was our premise that we would not uh, publish anything or tell anything if there was still a living descendant who would not want us to. And um, I think that was the most rewarding um, of our whole work to get in touch with people. And like I read on Joe's page, um, there is this one, I, I, I don't think I can quite quote it correctly, but um, <clears throat> of one of the people who joined in, in Joe's project, uh, we witnessed strangers to become acquaintances and acquaintances to become friends. And that was uh, something amazing. Gabi, you have told me before, and others, I think, um, about your work with descendants and how important it is, uh, but that it's about forgiveness and reconciliation. Um, can you maybe just to follow up on that question, uh, briefly explain why, why you're compelled to work with the descendants of Jews from these town uh, to get to reconciliation, to get to forgiveness? Uh, because you can put up 100 million memorials um, forgiveness can only come from people and through people. Okay. So, um, and understanding, you need to meet, you need to speak, and you need to <clears throat> try to find a way together to restore the human bridges that have been destroyed by the Nazis. And you cannot go that way alone. I, that we found that true remembrance work comes from remembering together. And of course, on the most part with the descendants, because we are restoring their Jewish uh, uh, memory also for them, but we found the same um, would happen between the descendants of the perpetrators who uh, accept, who of course, I'm not to blame and they're not to blame but we carry a responsibility to see to it that this will never happen again. Great, thank you, Gabby. Uh, Dan, another question? From Irwin, uh, in Clarksdale, Mississippi, there's a place that has a few slave shacks that they rent out on Airbnb. I guess this is for Joe, you probably know about it. What do you think about that? Shack up in, yes. I'm familiar with those. I, I would like to I'd like to stay in one, um, and you know, because I get asked about them often. Um, 
yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with those. But, but you know, 10 years ago, I used to get similar questions a lot because they would come in the form of, well, I know one that's being used for this or that. And lots of examples of what these places are being used for. Well, what I have discovered is uh, we as preservationists, we can't push too hard. Um, up, um, against these private owners and what they want to do with their buildings. Uh, we could only dictate to, so much. We can ask, we can request because there was a case in Missouri where uh, we uh, recommended to a lady what she should and should not do with her property and under the cover of darkness, she tore it down. Um, so that's, uh, so that's kind of a long way of saying that, um, yeah, these buildings are used for a lot of things. And, and all that uh, we ask from the slave dwelling project is access and for them to uh, preserve and tell the stories of the people who once inhabited the spaces. Uh, there are two questions about the future that are tough ones. Um, uh, one from um, our, our friend Steve Murray from the Alabama um, State Archives and History, um, who says that all of the panelists' experiences point to the fact that this work can take time to develop momentum and produce observable change. How does each one of them think about the sustainability of their programs? So their precious advancements are not lost at some point in the future. And then as if to help you, Amy Barnes said, what actions could governments at all levels take to help advance programs and goals like yours? Well, I guess, take General, what are you thinking about? Uh, what do you think needs to happen to keep all of this going? Well, Let's it's- start with it's, Joe. There we go. It, well, it, it, it certainly takes that, uh, uh, you know, whatever is done, it, takes that grassroots effort. Uh, <clears throat> hopefully a grassroots effort with uh, women involved. And, and yeah, I, I, I say that I, I say that with conviction because I, I, you, I'm, I'm often involved in a lot of efforts, preservation efforts. And um, you know I, if, if I go into a program, if I go into a place and I, and I know that there, there are ladies involved, women involved, then I, I have more confidence that it's going to work. We're going to reach our goals, um, because you know uh, I, I know me. I'm, I got good ideas. Um, my my follow through is not that great. So um, so it's, it's we certainly we certainly need the grassroots effort, uh, and we certainly need you know governments taking um, some type of ownership in what that project is, because. Is going to it's it's usually going to take some some funding. Uh, the idea is great, but uh, you know to make it work, it's it's going to take that funding. So it's going to take forming those coalitions of willing, a coalition of the willings, and hopefully someplace in there is a, is some 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 government ownership. So and, and Joe, it sounds to me like part of what you're saying is about the diversity of people who need to be behind an effort, right? The idea people and the planners and whoever they might be. And then the other piece is about resource, I think, uh, where governments can really step in. Um, I want to turn the question to Sheila, because I know, Sheila, the government has been both a supporter and the opposite, in some ways, of your project. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit, again, about sustainability first, how to sustain this you know, beyond you, and um, you know, what government can do to help. Um. Sustaining the museum was basically, when I opened it, came from large donations, uh, as I said, from the Jewish community of New York. And that kept us going for a while. And I would go before our city council time and time again to ask if we could get support like the other museums. And they wanted all of our information and everything that we had the donations where they were coming from. Um, and when they saw it all, they, they still turned us down. So I refused to go anymore to the city council and ask anybody for any money. So for 10 years, we survived on donations. Just uh, last year, 2019, we got our first grant from the state of Alabama Historical Commission. 
And I just received a letter today telling me that uh, I had applied for a $30,000 grant and I got half of it to help do some work in the new renovation project of the museum. So perseverance helps, uh, time helps, time brings about a change. And I guess they see that um, we weren't going anywhere. We weren't moving, we weren't giving up. We kept pushing forward and finally the door opened. And now, like Joe said, they come into me and ask them what can they do? So time has brought about a change. Great, great. I saw Joe giving you a fist bump there <laughs> and I'll just say congratulations. That's great, 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 great news. Um, Dan, one more, or uh, yeah, one more? I think we have time for one more. Well, a uh, follow up, I, I guess we just have us. Um, Alan, uh, we have a lot of other questions. I'm so sorry to those we had to leave behind. And, and what, hold on, Dan, and we will have some informal Q&A after this. We just need to wrap up in the next minute or two. Alan just wants to know if now, uh, Sheila, the city of Scottsboro's tourism folk are, are, are helping you now that they see what a fantastic place you have. Out of fact, I'm sitting in the tourism office today doing the Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. And they have the new tourism director, Sarah Stiles, and she has been a blessing to the museum. Um, she's opened up doors that I couldn't open and people would listen to her. And I heard the whispers of the town. Now that I know what the whispers are about, I can talk about the whispers uh, and why they didn't want to help us and, and different things like that. So the tourism department has truly helped and they, were, they didn't have anything to do with us with the um, National uh, Civil Rights Trail uh, that came about um, from the state tourism department, our local tourism department didn't really work towards the goal of getting that done. But now that we're on the national tourism uh, guide and on the national civil rights trail, uh, I can see a change in things. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Sheila. And I just like to say, Joel, I appreciate you and uh, the, the work that you do and widen the circle and, and, and making us a part of this today that I have been enlightened and by the things that you do and the work that you do and how you have reached out and brought us into it. And Steve Mary is a friend of mine and I'm glad to know that he's on the line today. Wonderful. Well, listen, uh, I just wanna say how honored I am to have all of our guests join us today. Uh, those are some great thoughtful questions. I'm gonna move a little fast here cause I wanna make sure we're done on time. Um, so I just want to close by telling everyone who's still with us about another virtual conversation that's coming up where you'll meet a new generation confronting racism's legacy. It will happen on December 9th, 1 p.m. Standard Time. Uh, you'll meet a student and teacher from Memphis who participated in a project where high school students are educating the community about lynchings and racial terror in Shelby County, Tennessee. Also joining us will be an Obermeyer Award winner, a teacher from Berlin, along with her student, uh, they have created a powerful memorial and education project focused on the train station that was directly across from their school where tens of thousands of Jews were sent to death camps. Uh, you can see some information in the chat box and we'll send more details in coming days. Uh, let's keep this conversation going. Uh, let's all work toward a better future. We invite you to contact us if you're engaged in this type of work or interested in engaging in it more. And please also consider following Widen the Circle on Facebook or Instagram or come to our website at widenthecircle.org. Um, thank you so much for joining us. This marks the official end of our time together. We expect there are still questions we have not gotten to and our guests have agreed to stay on for another 15 minutes or so with our speak speakers for an informal question and answer session. Um, but for those who need to leave, please do so. Uh, for those remaining, we'll wait maybe 30 seconds and get started again. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us.
<clears throat> and, and Dan, I'm assuming we do, but do we have a lot of questions? Uh, we now have uh, someone didn't want to ask a question. So now we have two left, actually. <laughs> All right, so we'll do, we can get just a couple more and we can wrap it up then. Um, well, this is from, um, give me a second. This yeah, we, we can start up again, I think. And, and for those who are remaining on, if you have a question, it'll be pretty easy to get through to us. Uh, but let's just do, you know, the last couple of questions and we can wrap up. Go ahead, Dan. Well, this is from uh, Patrick Sieglev uh, and, and Frank Zentrum in, in Berlin. Um, hearing about these examples of remembrance work in Germany and the US, I wonder what difference it makes when the victims of atrocity and persecution still live among us, or like in many German areas, not anymore. In other words, how is it different, I guess, if I could just paraphrase, when um, th there's so many, you know, descendants of the enslaved people living amongst what you do, where, where you are in she Sheila and Joe and in, in, in the North too, um, as opposed to in Germany where there's very few Jews left. Um, do you want me to answer that? Uh, and, and it seems like it's a very broad question, but- yeah, uh, so, uh, Gabby, why don't you give your perspective and then we can, we'll, we'll, um, we'll give Sheila and um, Joe a chance to think about it a little bit. Well, I wouldn't, um... I would say the Jewish communities in Germany are not really that small percentage wise to, you know, all of Europe and not, of course, you cannot compare it to the United States. But although, although, although Gabi, just for a second, most of the Jews in Germany are really from former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. They, they are or they uh, come from Israel, but uh, what I wanted to say, there are still 95,000 registered. They, they join a Jewish uh, synagogue they are, or a Jew, Jewish community. Of course, there are more. I think the number is around 200,000. Okay. Okay. It's, but what, what I think what, what, um, what is meant by um, that they don't live here, I think that refers to um, the Jewish uh, communities that, that lived in Germany before the war. Right. I think that's what happened. And, um, and there it's true, like in Mainz, I think there were over 3,000 um, Jewish people living here. And uh, or, no, it's, it's really, I think 1,800 or 1,300, 13 or 1,800 went into hiding and only 60 survived. So that was the Jewish community, how it started in 45 in Mainz. So I think that's what uh, people refer to. Yeah, sure. And, and, and I assume, right. uh, Gabi, let me, go, I, I see Joe's ready to talk and I think Sheila's thinking a little bit. Um, and I wanna make sure we get the US perspective on this. Yeah. Um, so Joe, why don't, why don't you jump in for a second? Yeah, there, well, certainly there aren't any, um, you know, victims of, of, of slavery. The, the, in the physical sense as it existed up until 1865, uh, but um, we're, we're victimized by, you know, those things that replace slavery, uh, you know, like convict labor and, 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 and redlining and KKK and lynchings, um, uh, accumulate the ability to accumulate wealth by those who enslave, of course, presented, uh, prevented those who were enslaved the opportunity to accumulate wealth in the, in that manner, and so we're we're, we're more victimized by that that uh, uh, that economic divide that uh, exists because of that system that uh, that was in place up until 1865 and those things that replaced that that system. Um, so. Uh, no, we 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 um, the difference between you know what's in Germany and the fact that yes, there are people who were were a part of that that are still alive today, but uh, you know historically in uh, you know that that time frame in the distance of you know 1865 to 1945, uh, it, it's it shows more on the digital. I'm sorry, not the digital divide, but the economic divide. Sure. Um, Joe, I think uh, uh, part of the question, I think, though, is though there are Jews in Germany, I don't mean to say that there aren't, and Gabi made that point straight. It's still true that many people doing remembrance work in Germany do it about communities that don't longer, no longer exist. 
That's true. Right, a, a, an abandoned synagogue, a cemetery that's fallen apart, um, or some other thing where the people who used to be that community are no longer exist. And I think where the question's coming from, I think, is in the US, the work that you do, it's not that the community's still sitting there, it's that there was not this moment where everybody who was part of it just looked, were killed and were exiled, uh, that the, the descendants are still around us. And, I, and the, the question is, how does that change the remembrance work? How does that change what you do? Since well, yeah, the, but well, in, in that descendancy also is historical trauma. You know, all, sure. all, all, that, um, all that our ancestors endured, uh, the fact that they were muffled, the, the, the fact that they were uh, muted um, uh, in, uh, in, in their existence here. Um, what our opportunity is, uh, is to give them their voice, uh, you know, uh, have their uh, existence remembered. And, and that's what the, you know, that's what the Slave Dwelling Project does. And we, we have their, their places and their voices uh, remembered through these places that, you know, that we, we try to save. And, and then, you know, there's always, uh, um, there's always often a place involved, something that, that, that you could touch, something tangible. When, when you could have something tangible, something that you could touch or something that you could see, you know, it jars that, uh, it jars that memory. And um, you know the slave dwelling project jars that memory through these uh, through these places. Go ahead, Gabby. I see you really want to say something. Uh, because, to because because Joe Joe is talking about places, and every time I hear this, it's just so true that you need these places, and that's why we would love to have that old synagogue restored. Uh, Gabby, what, syn the, what synagogue is this? The the a synagogue in one of the villages. Uh, that we wrote about and we as children have never heard about it we we didn't know that it even existed but now we do and we know its history and every time i see it it just and just the fact that it still exists after everything that took place you know and and even the sorry state it is in um it just amazes me every time i see it and uh and 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 you stand in front of that building and you it, it just makes you stop and wonder and it just beckons you to come in you know but but unfortunately the doors are, are closed and and how wonderful it would be to um, have it restored and open it would almost feel like coming home in a way you know is it, is it, and it's again i think it's again that's connection to the physical spaces exactly uh, joe talked about it you talked about it and while Sheila, you didn't use these exact words, you can, it, the way you describe your museum, you can almost feel it um, in a kind of a similar way. Uh, so that's really a great point. Um, the museum was built by former slaves, 11 years after they were free, um, white missionaries came and helped them build a wood frame building. And it had taken renovation under renovation three times and to what you see now, but the old building is wrapped around the new building. Um, and we have a piece of history that's still on the ground, a little shack uh, that I would always have to stay there uh, that reminds you where uh, traveling preachers will come and sleep in that little shack on the ground of the museum. And talking about slavery, uh, you can be involved in slavery in so many different ways. Uh, injustice, for instance, uh, the nine boys that went to prison uh, for a crime they did not commit. And when you look at what's going on today, uh, that's a form of slavery. The, the police brutality, all of this that's happening today. And it really hurts uh, to see this happening in the 21st century that we can say that history is almost repeating itself from uh, reading books. Um, I saw where in a book I was reading where in the 30s they would go out and just 
pick up black men and put them in jail and the other white men would come and rent them out and take them away from their uh, families and have them working on their farms and plantations. And the families would never know sometimes where they went. Uh, 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 are they killed or what? Right, and this I is forced labor. That yep. happened in this town a lot. Convict leads to release it. Yep. Can I say something too? Can I say something? Hey, yeah, please, know? please do. Okay. Uh, One of the things uh, uh, we still we have a lot of memorials to black people, slavery around us that have not been identified. What has happened is that because of the history that was written about, say, Annabella Mahomes or items like that, or, or buildings or, or courthouses or jailhouses, those houses have, uh, or those places, and a lot of places that are not even still around, they have identifications, but the history has not been told. Right. So mm -hmm. therefore, there are a lot of, of places that need the history need to be rewritten. So it includes everybody who was involved in the in the building and the uh, and, and, and involved in everything around that that place. So what I'm what I'm saying, my, my long story is to say that we have a lot of places and and uh, and um, a, a source a, a lot of places, a lot of uh, structures structures that will. Um, go towards our history if it's told right. And one of the reasons what it happened, I'm a genealogist, so family historian. Sure, one sure. of the things I've been finding in the documents that, have, that that's right there in front of us are all these related information that has been uh, neglected to be told. So we have not only uh, places, buildings, and history, but we also have paper documents. Right. Back up some of this stuff. Okay, I'm through. <laughs> No, no worries. I, I, I just want to point out uh, another way of saying, summarizing sort of what you said. Good. There's a lot of remembrance work still to be done. Mm -hmm. A lot of it. I think in, in both sides of the Atlantic. Um, so uh, uh, I think that's probably got to be our last question. Uh, so I think I'm going to wrap up now. Um, and let me just say something again. I really appreciate the thoughtful questions. Uh, thanks again to Sheila, Joe, and Gabi for joining us uh, and giving us their work and their wisdom. Um, I'm going to end with a quote that I didn't have a chance to say earlier in the session, but I think it's a good one to end with. Uh, they remind me of a quote from Maya Angelou that I first encountered at the Legacy Museum uh, by the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not live, be lived again. And um, I think each of our guests uh, sort of are pushing in that direction. And I hope we see more. Um, so let's keep this conversation going on both sides of the Atlantic. And let's all keep working toward a better future. Again, we invite you to contact us if you're engaged in this type of work or interested in engaging it more. Uh, please consider following Widen the Circle on Facebook or Instagram or come to our website at widenthecircle.org. Uh, we will send you a follow-up email that includes links to uh, work by our three uh, speakers. And uh, please check out those links. And uh, I think that's it. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to our guests. And um, I hope we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.